my great pleasure to introduce Nina Kusher, who is an associate professor of history at Clark University. She is the author of the brilliant Erotic Exchanges, Elite Prostitution in 18th Century Paris, which I, my students have read chapters on, as well as several co-edited volumes, as we found out this morning, including most recently, Histories of French um, Sexuality, um, with this problematic title, but not really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever. Edited um, with a a Andrew Israel Ross, and she's currently co-editing the Bloomsbury Cultural History of Prostitution, and the Bloomsbury Handbook of the History of Sexuality, and while at the same time working on monograph on adultery in 18th century France. That was smooth, wasn't it? Yeah, we're all, we're all playing Megan today. Um, our, um, great, now I've lost my Debt 
which required both spouses to have sex with the other on demand. This is prescriptive, of course, but the scarcity of marital rape claims, which I'll get to in a minute, suggests that it was well accepted, as you discussed, <laughs> and it leads to what I'm calling the marital paradox, that women implicitly consented to sexual conduct, contact they may very well have explicitly rejected. So most of what I've read about sexual consent um, in marriage frames around a contract, social, cultural, and religious item implicit in the marital contract. It's not written down, but it's assumed. Um, as in many other contracts, their conditions which nullify uh, this particular component of the contract. And again, I allude to the work of Justine and Marion, have shown that there are limits to consent. Um, uh, so in other words, when a woman marries and has sex, this implicit um, post-nuptial consent is not, uh, does not work all the time for everything. And Marion found a couple of situations in which it, it doesn't, it's contested. Um, the first is when a woman's coerced to marry. Um, and then, so the idea is that women, there's pressure to marry, but you're not supposed to be coerced to marry a specific person, um, which would then, of course, translate into being forced to have 20 years of sex with that person. Um, she's shown that if the initial consent was coerced, it imperiled the validity of the marriage. She also showed that women did not consent to every sexual practice. In fact, uh, some um, went to court in order to say, I don't want to have sex with my um, husband who has syphilis. Or some did not want to engage in what might have considered, they might have considered aberrant sexual practices like oral sex. I've actually seen this in my own work. Here's a quick example. On in April 27, 1754, the Paris police reported that the Duke of Luxembourg came across his daughter, the Duchess of Montmorency, crying. She apparently told him uh, that since his uh, that since his son, the Duke de Montmorency, had started seeing prostitutes, by which uh, the police meant several women in the opera uh, who were dominant to you. Il avait pour elle toutes sortes de mauvaises façons, mauvaise façon, which, considering what happened next, I took to mean that the son expected of his wife the kind of sexual acts he was getting from his mistresses. Um, I've discussed this case in, in other contexts. Um, so these cases, re uh, returning to the original set of criteria for sexual consent, we see that the original consent cannot be coerced, and for the dur duration of the marriage, it was really just around specific sex acts. But while there are limits, as Mita just mentioned, and Marianne discussed just now, violence was not among them. As Julie Harbick recently, uh, has recently shown, and Marianne showed um, just now, the violent nature of consensual sex is rendered visible because of another issue that brought women to court. When they had been promised marriage by a lover, who subsequently abandoned them without making arrangements to provide for the child. Female litigants explained that they had agreed to have sex often with a partner with whom there was shared affection and even love, and did so as a step on the way to marriage. But the sex was violent nonetheless. And to be clear, these litigants were not complaining about the violence, only failure to deal with the consequences of the sex itself. So again, <laughs> this has been said. Um, so if, the, if, if marriages or, or relationships had such violent beginnings, um, did that suggest that the sex was violent throughout? Um, one set of documents that might hold the answer to these questions are petitions for separation de corps, which is when a wife asked uh, the court to be fit to physically leave the marital abode and live somewhere else. And often the reason for this request was that the husband was violent and that his violence exceeded community norms, which for us would be egregious. In other words, in modern sensibilities, he was extremely violent. So in, for me, in reading dozens of petitions for these kinds of separations, they always cite violence, often the most truly appalling histories of beatings. But I didn't find any that mentioned sexual violence. Uh, Jeffrey Merrick, who's read every petition for separation in the police commissioner's papers for a sample set of years across the century, found very few. And Marion, and she discusses this in her article on Cleo, found only a handful as well. Um, so we know women did experience unwanted sexual contact, often violent in their tellings, but, and from their husbands, but they were rarely included in separation petitions 
because with some exceptions, um, marital, marital rape was not grounds for separation. So the framework we're, we're using is the contract. The wife exchanged sexual access to her body at marriage in exchange for a name and financial support, you know the rest of the song. Um, and this is how marital rape is silenced in the historical record. Um, but the, the framework of contract also limits our own ability to get at the silences. It explains how the paradox came to be, but doesn't really give us any conceptual space to examine what was really happening in this marriage. Um, so one, one approach that might allow us to understand marital rape in the context of early modern marriages is to bring in some of the scholarship on transactional sex. This is depressing, but it's even more depressing when I tell you where I got the idea. So I taught a history of prostitution course a couple years ago, and I was like, all right, everyone, let's define prostitution, right? Because you always define your terms when you, when you start something like this. And um, it was like everything. All sex is prostitution. And that's where they ended up. Even in a long-term loving, loving relationship, my students argued both partners, so usually the woman, if it was a heterosexual um, relationship, traded sex for something in the context of the relationship beyond expressions of love, beyond affection, and beyond sexual the, the need for sexual satisfaction. So I was like, oh, OK, yes, what do we do? Um, and um, so I didn't necessarily agree with their conclusions, was, um, but I think that's an apt framework to think about um, you know, the marital paradox that allows us to sort out agreeing to have sex from wanting to have sex. Um, and while it, and it, it simultaneously allows us to disaggregate individual sexual encounters from a sex life that might otherwise blur them all together in the context of the marital debt under the Egypt, aegis Egypt, of, of nuptial consent. So just a quick aside, um, there's different ways to define transactional sex. For some people, it's the same as, um, as sex work. Um, but I rely on the definition that it's non-commercial, it's usually non-marital, non-commercial sexual relationships motiv motivated by an implicit assumption that sex will be exchanged for material support or other benefits. So it's not, it's not sex work, but there is recompense that's material. Um, so that's the, the definition that I'm using. So if we think of marriage, uh, if we think of sex within marriage as transactional, then each encounter is transactional. And then we can try to understand that like, women consented to each encounter for a wide variety of reasons. There's love, affection, desire, convention, the desire for children, awareness that sex is part of the larger bargain, but also to avoid being yelled at, to be beaten, to be beaten more, um, and taking a page out of current discussions of sexual relationships in marriage to manage difficult husbands. The literature on sex work ranges from a radical feminist position that sex workers cannot choose to sell sex because they are part of a larger patriarchal system that compels their sexual surrender to men, to the horse rights movement that says women have total agency over their bodies, and that prostitution is sort of an act of rebellion. Each position and much in between them creates space to think about sexual consent of marriage. Of course, none of this solves the problem of the scarcity of sources, but this model does allow us to think about when women did not consent, where they resisted, and where uh, coercion was used. I should just add um, just two more points. I'm not timing myself stupidly. Um, amongst, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> amongst social historians, <laughs> the question of how much agency prostitutes had over their sex life is the central question. And answers are often go down to the granular level. Like we can't make these large assumptions because it's really about individuals in their lives. Um, if marital sex is transactional, then that question of agency gets forefronted, um, coming back to me as comment. Um, now, all of this is not to make any comment about the satisfaction, the, the sex lives of women in general. There were certainly women who had sex because they wanted to and enjoyed doing so. Um, they talk about it in various sources. Uh, but one has to ask, ask whether for women, sex became part of a larger calculus of constrained choices to borrow a concept from quiet All right, uh, that's all we have. Thank you.
question. Um, Jim has a microphone. So. Sure. Hi. Uh, wonderful panel, Jacob Burnham. Um, my question kind of brings it back to the 18th century and it builds off of Marion's point about a cultural break, but the kind of broader and flip side of that, but the culture of consent, which is also a kind of narrative that's permeating in the United States. Um, and with um, Justine's paper actually made me think of it when she talked about how at the turn of the 17th century the, the language of consent was changing and what motivated this. And so I kind of posed to everybody about what the, the states, the early modern, the emerging early modern states, stakes in consent and the development of consent kind of is and how they're you know interacting with that, whether it's through legislation or through consent of marriage, this very handily asked family state compact kind of idea, or the prosecution of the rape and all of these other kinds of things, or the protection of the church and that kind of stuff. Uh, be sure to speak into the microphone so it's the report. Or uh, we could we could pass you the yeah, part of the Oh yeah, I can rephrase it. Sorry, hold on. Um, no, no, just uh, just uh, for for their oh, yeah. Yeah. oh sorry. Just uh, how is like how do you see the idea of the state interacting with consent and helping to bolster all of the points that you're making about the church and the the central kind of administration, not to get rid of the agency, which is implicit and important in consent, but consent also has to be negotiated between a whole a host of parties and especially with prosecutions of rap and these kinds of things. How are the kind of state administrators who decide what's legal or illegal and all of these kinds of things kind of interacting with and engaging with that? Okay. Should I use um, I can start um, because uh, my work um, deals quite explicitly with the state. Um, I think um, so for Pavimontaire in particular, um, I think what they were, one of the things that, that, that they were grappling with was how um, crimes that interrupted stable households and stable lineages, how those could then compound to um, interact with the credibility and the ability of, of, of the society and therefore the state to function. So, um, and so they sort of responded um, in such a way that it helped to um, maintain maintain a certain amount of stability. And so one of the arguments I didn't really have a chance to get into it just because I mean, um, I could, if I'd given the paper I wanted to give it, it would have been an hour and a half. Because it, um, it was really hard to wrestle it down to 19 and a half minutes. Um, but. One of the things I noticed is that um, while adultery, um, these adultère par force cases, while well, they sort of, they eventually sort of disappear from um, the parliamentary record, um, this is also the period of time where I'm starting to see a major increase in rap by seduction cases. Interestingly, cases that were probably not attractive to the officiante. So anyway, so and so I think people were actually. You engage in the criminal court on purpose to get different outcomes. Um, so th that's sort of a, a meandering answer. It was a meandering question. <laughs> Does anyone else? <laughs> I think, I, I just want to follow up. I think the question in terms of the clergy of consent, it is often determined by what's happening in the local communities. And that, that's another reason why these multiple archives are helpful, because the dynamic between the, the individual priest and that community really varies all over the place. You know, in, in terms of the, going back to my Jacques Cadier affair, um, I, I think the issue of consent, it wasn't there, but but it was there was a whole political element that was invested in showing some kind of loss of will, right? Um, that, that that came came into play and um, and and so for and, and and I also wonder too. So for example, in Toulouse, there was very little in the files of the officialité, but in terms of the parliament and spiritual instance, that was a very busy parliament, which you don't see. So it's not an equivalent. So I think again, that's that's very regionally defined. So again, yet again, 
And, and I, I think that that can be its own form of erasure, is just being aware of that. Alors, merci pour cette question. Et elle est très compliquée. En fait. <rire> elle est très, très, très compliquée. Euh, donc, en gros, si j'ai bien compris, c'est la relation de, de l'État avec cette question de, du consentement et s'il y a des, des, des évolutions. Euh, moi, ce que, je, ce que je peux voir dans les archives euh, bah, sur ces questions-là de, de séduction euh, par rapport à, à l'Église, en fait, euh, ça, ça reste vraiment pas un sujet de préoccupation, en fait, le consentement dans ces affaires-là, sur toute la période. Euh, je ne vois pas vraiment l'évolution. Euh, je vois l'évolution, par contre, dans les... Euh, comme je l'ai présenté, hein, dans, les, dans les discours, en fait, des, des, des femmes euh, qui euh, ont avantage appuyé sur leur, sur leur résistance pour prouver, en fait, leur moralité et puis euh, et peut-être aussi parce qu'elles ont plus conscience aussi de, je sais, enfin, là, c'est des, des grandes questions, plus conscience de la violence qui leur est imposé, je ne sais pas, par exemple, de qui ça pour analyser ces, ces témoignages-là et ces, ces évolutions-là. Euh, sinon, sur le, il, y a, il, y a plein de, il y a plein de domaines en fait, dans le consentement, dans l'histoire du consentement, parce que là, on a parlé de, des relations avant le mariage, des relations euh, euh, d'un prêtre avec euh, ses, euh, ses subordonnés, enfin, en tout cas, ses ouailles. Euh, on a parlé aussi de, euh, de la question du, euh, du consentement dans le mariage. Et en fait, chaque domaine a vraiment euh, sa législation propre euh, et chaque euh, tribunal a une, un rapport différent en fait, avec, le, avec les, ces questions-là. Euh, c'est avant tout une question de, de compétence aussi quand on regarde dans les, dans les archives. Euh, c'est une question de compétence judiciaire. Donc, euh, euh, d'un côté, ce n'est pas étonnant que l'officialité ne se pose pas la question du consentement en fait, euh, dans ces, euh, ces procédures-là parce que ce n'est pas, pas l'objet de la procédure en, en elle-même. Euh, et eux, ils regardent vraiment que ça. Donc, euh, est-ce que, euh, est que les juges ecclésiastiques ne sont pas touchés par ces témoignages de violence euh, On ne saura, enfin, on saura pas. Euh, ils exercent leur fonction en tant que magistrat et, et ce n'est pas ce qui, est, ce qui les concerne euh, non plus. Euh, donc, donc voilà, c'est une, une question assez complexe en fait. I'm afraid time's up. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. To answer that question too, which is, sorry. I think this is part, I think this is part of the answer too, which is that France has so many different legal jurisdictions. So like when you mentioned coverture, coverture does not exist in many parts of France in the way that, you know, that word is often used. And so Toulouse and um, Besançon, Lyon, Paris all have very different legal regimes, which is going to have a very strong impact on, excuse me, on how all these cases are carried out. So I just had to, yeah. I had to say that. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Jenny. I think that's a great, uh, it's always a good way to end a panel on um, 18th century with, and 17th and 16th century with. It's really complicated. There's like 700 legal systems, so <laughs> that's, that's the daily that's the daily um, threat to our to our lives. Um, but thank you so much for coming and for um, it's the last panel of the conference, and so it takes true commitment. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Very much.